stand up here and hear your singing tonight. They'll sound just wonderful. It's a, it's a wonderful thing just to sometimes just belt out the hymns. Just sing them from your heart. I learned a long time ago that as long as everybody's singing loudly, then it all sounds good. And so, I always warn people, don't be shy when it comes to singing in corporate worship. Just sing as unto the Lord. And I believe God's, God's pleased. What a wonderful hymn of the faith. Psalm 55. Psalm 55. I should have said Psalm of the faith. Psalm 55 this evening. We will be in a couple of places. If you are not familiar with turning or opening in your Bible, probably most Bibles, if you were to just open them up halfway, just open up to the middle of the Bible, then you'd find Psalm 55. And we do have Bibles available underneath each of the chairs. There's a reason why it is that we want people to open the Scripture and look at it. We want you, first of all, to know for yourself what God says. You know, uh, you are putting a lot of trust in someone if you trust a preacher because you like their personality or because they've been a help to you before. But if you don't check, you don't check what the Scripture says, I think you'll do yourself a disservice. You want to know, thus saith the Lord. How, where does, how does God speak to us today? Well, in His Word. And so our word this evening is from Psalm 55. Will you please look down to verse 12 in chapter 55 of the Psalms? And we're going to look at a statement. This psalm, of course, was written by David. And uh, we're going to look at a statement, and we're going to see this evening another good example of a bad example in the Scripture. And this is a tough one, to be quite frank with you, because I think perhaps more than any other of our bad examples, I can relate to this man's bad example. And I can see his point of view, I think, probably more than anyone else. Those are some of the most helpful, I think, sometimes because what we want to know is God's point of view. So, Psalm 55, 12. For it was not an enemy that reproached me, then I could have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me, that did magnify himself against me, then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and mine acquaintance, we took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God in company. Let's read that verse again. We took sweet counsel together and walked unto the house of God in company. Let's pray. Our Father, I pray that you would help us as we look tonight at this good example of a bad example. Help us again to look at ourselves. Lord, your word says that if we would judge ourselves that we should not be judged. Boy, that would be true in this example. And I pray that you would give us divine wisdom, convince our hearts from the Word, we pray this evening. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, if you know who Psalm 55 is talking about, don't be a spoiler. Uh, I see Charlie with his smug grin over there, like, I know who this is. Don't tell anybody. You do too, Mrs. Dollins? Two people. Yeah, okay. Yeah, a lot of you folks do, but if you don't know, don't ruin it for everybody else. That way we can have just a little bit of a tool of suspense. By the way, Andrew, I'm not deliberately trying to preach long tonight to be mean to you. It's just happening naturally. <laughs> no, do, do, whatever, so, do whatever you yeah, feel. I do. I do. There, are, there are preachers that realize that there is that uh, the fight, right? Tonight there's a fight or some kind of, some kind of competition. Fight. And so they deliberately make it hard on the people that they know are there and actually the fact of the matter is that they really ought to be upset with people that are that are at church and wanting to go watch the game they really ought to be more upset at the people that aren't there but isn't it true we usually holler at the people you know sort of preaching at the choir kind of a thing more often than not and the fact of the matter is that I'm on the verge of not even caring about it, you know, it's kind of like if you don't care, then I don't care. I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, I do have an opinion about the game, but it's not the overriding sense. And I just want to, I want to rib Andrew while he's still happy. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I just, <laughs> so let's just get a truce right now. I'm going to try for like two weeks not to talk about it if it doesn't go the way you want tonight. Okay, so he's wearing Eagles socks in case you guys are wondering what he wants tonight. I'm also an Eagles fan. What's that? I'm also an Eagles oh, you are also an Eagles fan. Okay, so uh, Brother Matt, are you an Eagles fan? 
Yeah, you're rooting against the goat. Anybody but Brady. Anybody but Brady. Okay, <laughs> so so we everybody has taken their stand. We know he, Brother Matt's got a green shirt on. Uh, Brother Andrew's wearing yeah. socks, and Bella is just straight up an Eagles fan. And Sophia, it doesn't care because Aaron Rodgers has nothing to do with this. Boy, the number one most Christian team in. Well, yeah, yeah, they did. Yeah. Okay. See, we just sidetracked talking about <laughs> the Eagles. I know you're a Packer fan. Lord bless your heart. <laughs> Cheese all the way. <laughs> Psalm 55. All right, we already read our text, and the question, the question really is, who is this individual that David said that we took sweet counsel together and walked unto the house of God in company? Ever think about that? I mean, David said, if it were an enemy that betrayed me, if it was an enemy that was against me, it would be one thing. He said, but my enemy is the person that counseled me, that, that, that knows everything about me, knows what I do. Have you ever noticed that in a, in a competition or a wrestling match, there are just people that it seems like they've got your number as far as that goes? One of the... One of the most dominant basketball players, I don't care if you're a basketball player or not, you can understand dominance. One of the most dominant basketball players ever was Shaquille O'Neal. The game has never seen the likes of the man as far as the just sheer dominance of the guy. He's only seven foot tall, so he wasn't exceptionally tall. But the guy was, what, 360 pounds? And he could leap like a, a gazelle and run the court full speed and when Shaq wanted to throw a bow, as he called it, or hit you with an elbow, the biggest men in the league would just get just wiped out. And if you listen to Shaquille O'Neal as a retired Shaq talk about the toughest guys he ever played against, he'll talk about no-name guys. He's like, that guy just had my number. He could just block me. He could just defend me. And just for whatever reason, there was nothing special about his shot, but he could just shoot over me. And he'll list guys. I can't remember the names of the guys. or some. Some slow white guy that he talks about. I can't remember the name of the guy. But some slow white guy that Shaq could not stop him, and he could stop Shaq. You know, it's just some guy's just got your number. I call it little brother syndrome. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody here an older brother and have a younger brother? Younger brother can never beat you up. Younger brother may outweigh you. He may be taller than you. But younger brother just can't. It's just a psychological disadvantage that he'll be... He'll be hampered with his entire life. I've told my brother, I've said, if I die before you, kick me. Because I won't be able to do anything about it. But until then, you lose. That's just the way it goes. You know, It's funny because almost into our 30s, every time we would see each other, my brother and I would end up in a wrestling match. You know, And I, he'd, I think he just would think, you know, I'm going to get him this time. And it was never close, was it, Melissa? Just never close. And it's not because he isn't strong or couldn't wrestle or could whatever. It's just little brother can't beat big brother. It's just there's a psychological disadvantage to it. Now that's a little bit of a silly illustration. But the truth of the matter is that someone who's gone to war with you and someone that's gone to worship with you is not someone that you want to go to war against. Because they know, they know what you do. They know that move you have. They know the whatever. Uh, they say in basketball, the only person that ever could really defend Michael Jordan and shut him down completely was Scottie Pippen. Because they kind of grew up together and played against each other. And they say, fortunately, Jordan never had to play against Pippen because they were on the same team. But Scottie Pippen could shut him down. He could close him down. He, just, he grew up with Jordan. He knew his moves. He knew the way he played. And so he, could, he knew how to defend him. And uh, so... This was that kind of a situation that David is talking about. He's talking about what a dismay, what a despair it is. And really, there's more than just the ability of this person to take counsel against David. More than anything else, it's the betrayal of it. The heartbreak of it. Have you ever been so hurt by somebody, it just seemed like you didn't want to fight back? You know, somebody said something to you. Normally, when we're offended or we're hurt, there's a natural rise in us to strike back, to say something, to put someone in their place, or to get back at them. But you know, when it's someone that you're really, really close with, and they say something hurtful or uh, something that wounds you, it's just like, 
oh, it's just devastating, and there's no answer back. Uh, that's the way it is in a, in a close husband-wife relationship. I mean, it's just you're just each other's best friends. You're each other's protectors, each other's bulwark. And then when one of you says something on purpose to hurt the other one, boy, I tell you, it's just like, oh. And when you're married, you're one flesh. And so, you know, you can't respond because if you hurt your spouse, you hurt yourself. You hurt your spouse, you hurt your marriage. It's your marriage, you hurt so hurt yourself. And so it's one of those things. And that is that is the degree to which David was wounded by this individual who betrayed him and took counsel against him. Now the second question, or the real I guess the first question about this this evening is not so much who it is, though we'll be there in a second. If you'll go to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 15 while we continue to discuss it. But uh, the second question would be, how could anyone who was that close to King David, particularly a person who would have gone to the house of the Lord with King David? See, David here is indicating this is not some person. You know, I, Joab... I mean, Joab was one of David's mighty men. But Joab on a number of occasions betrayed David. So much so that David told his son Solomon when he was going to become king, he says, don't let his hoary head go to the grave. Don't let him die of old age. You better kill Joab or he will haunt you. He will cause you problems. And we know that Joab was part of trying to set up Adonijah. Joab, after David had a truce with Abner, murdered Abner. And uh, Joab betrayed David. And, I, and, you know, Joab, you know, you think he probably just had some things on David, but he, was, he helped David a lot, but it was one of those almost love-hate relationships at the end of their lives. And so a betrayal by Joab wouldn't have, wouldn't have been so harmful, <coughs> wouldn't have hurt so badly. This is a betrayal of someone that David is walking in counsel with. And the question is, if you're the kind of a person that has that kind of a relationship with David, and you also evidently have a relationship with God. Because you didn't just go to war and counsel together. You went to the house of the Lord together. In other words, there was a spiritual relationship. And if you betrayed David when you had that kind of a relationship, what is going on? What is going on with someone that would betray that kind of a relationship? And so I want to look at 2 Samuel chapter 15. And uh, this is the story of Absalom, actually, that's being referred to in Psalm 55. If you take notes in your Bible and put cross-references, you could write maybe over uh, 2 Samuel 15. You could write that reference we looked at, Psalm 55, 12 through 15. I kind of recommend that you do. Sometimes it's helpful when you're reading just to have those cross-references because you may not have a, a perfect memory like Charlie does, and you may just it may slip your mind. Uh, but chapter 15, and I'd like to look at verse... 10. This is when Absalom, David's own son, is trying to set himself up as king. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, As soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then ye shall say, Absalom reigneth in Hebron. And the Bible says, And when, with Absalom, verse 11, went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called, and they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. That's not a crowd you want to hang with there, my friend. That is the simple man as described in Proverbs. Uh, verse 12, And Absalom sent for Ahithophel the Galenite, David's counselor, from his city, even Gilo, while he offered sacrifices. And the conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. Now let's stop here and let's analyze just a little bit. It's interesting, isn't it? See, Absalom is David's son, and David's son to whom uh, David really never refused or stopped from doing anything. David loved Absalom in his heart, but it didn't raise Absalom well. And it ended up killing Absalom. Absalom had done, had committed some terrible sins. And the question here is, we find David, Absalom deciding he's going to set up his kingdom and the Bible says these men that followed him followed him in their simplicity. They, the, the, what the Scripture indicates is they actually didn't have an idea that it was even a problem. In other words, they're thinking, well, this is Absalom. He's David's son, and so he is a legitimate heir to the throne as far as they're concerned. And they're thinking, oh, this is great. You know, David's getting older, and it's time to get some young blood in here. And Absalom has actually been setting himself 
He's been standing in the gate and setting himself up as a judge. When David doesn't have time for people, Absalom does. And so someone comes with a case or a matter, and Absalom shows a lot of wisdom and a lot of discernment, and he, he helps people with their problems, and he's functioning like a king. And so it doesn't seem like a grand stretch for him to actually be the king. And so that's the conspiracy that these men, they're simple. They don't understand that this isn't God's will and this isn't actually David's will. And David hasn't done anything to stop Absalom from getting to this point. But what is interesting here is the question, how did Absalom know that David's best counselor would not counsel against him? In other words, how did Absalom know that he could send for this man Ahithophel and that Ahithophel would say okay and join him against his dear confidant or the person he was a confidant to David how did Absalom know that why would Ahithophel betray David the king now I know you know if you know the answer don't tell because you're ruining it for everybody else but it's a good question and it's one that bears our reflection isn't it why would a man like Ahithophel <coughs> Turn from David to whom he'd been loyal to and they literally had walked into the house of God together. You just don't betray a friendship like that. That isn't usual. That isn't even unusual. That's unheard of. You wouldn't turn against David, particularly not if you had the spiritual connection as well as the physical connection. I could completely relate to Joab deciding that he didn't want Solomon to be the king and that he was going to help Adonijah be king because Joab really didn't have a spiritual connection desire. He didn't have a heart to say, you know what, I want a king that's after God's heart. He wanted a king that would advance the military. He wanted a king that would serve his political purpose. So I can understand Joab, but I'm just telling you, this guy Ahithophel, he loved the Lord. And he loved David. So why would he betray David? See, that, that makes the mystery grow deeper if you don't know the answer yet, doesn't it? It just makes it all work. Why would he do this? What would cause a man like Ahithophel to do this? Let's go to chapter 16 of 2 Samuel. <coughs> chapter 16. Uh, if you know the story of Absalom, uh, actually, let's go to uh, verse 15. Uh, ver chapter, I mean, sorry, chapter 15, verse 30. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, this is David has found out that Absalom's trying, his son is trying to overthrow him. Now notice this, verse 30 of chapter 15. And David went up, by, up the, by the ascent of Mount Olivet and wept as he went up and had his head covered and he went barefoot. And all the people that was with him covered every man his head and they went up weeping as they went up. So David's crying. And David's not crying because he's a sissy. As a matter of fact, read the life of David sometime. There's not a more courageous man in the world. There never has been a more courageous man than David. David had a tender heart, but he was not afraid. And he was not afraid of Absalom, I promise you that. David was upset because his son betrayed him and he was in a situation where he actually was probably going to have to kill his son. That's the reality of it. Now you read the account and it looks as though David is in, he's, he's back fleeing Saul again. You know, he's the underdog. But you know, David never really was the underdog actually when he was fleeing Saul. It was not just a saying in Israel that Saul hath killed his thousands and David hath killed his ten thousands. There was no comparison with the two of them when it came to valor and courage. Uh, David on any occasion actually could have slain Saul. When Saul threw a javelin and tried to stick David to the wall, David could have pulled it out and gone after that man. I promise you, the guy that killed Goliath could make any man in the world run. The Philistines, even when David came to them in peace, or terrified of him. So David is not running barefoot up the mountain as an elderly man bawling his eyes out because he's scared he's going to die. He's never been afraid of death in his entire life. He's broken hearted. Verse 31, And one told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. And David said, O Lord, I pray thee, turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. And it came to pass that when David was come to the top of the mount where he worshipped God, behold, Hushai the archite came to meet him with his coat rent and earth upon his head. 
unto whom David said, If thou passest on with me, then thou shalt be a burden unto me. But if thou return to the city and say unto Absalom, I will be thy servant, O king, as I have been thy father's servant hitherto, so will I now also be thy servant. Then mayest thou for me defeat the counsel of Ahithophel. And he goes on to talk about Zadok and Abiathar uh, and so forth. And uh, in verse 37, the Bible says, So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city, and Absalom came in to Jerusalem. <coughs> now, David finds out that Ahithophel has betrayed him. And this man Hushai comes, who's another counselor. But there's no one like uh, Ahithophel, because Ahithophel, it was said about him that when he said something was going to pass, it was like it was the Word of God. The oracle of God, the scripture said. I mean, literally, uh, in verse 23 of chapter 16, look at this. Uh, when the counsel of in the counsel of Ahithophel, which he counseled in those days, was as if a man had inquired at the oracle of God, so was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. So when Ahithophel said, Okay, here's what I think we should do, it was like the Bible said it. The word oracle of God is used in Romans chapter 2 as a phrase, and it's used as the, one of the reasons that Israel is accountable for knowing who Jesus Christ was and receiving Him and for being born again. And they're accountable because unto them were committed the oracles of God. Now the Bible here in, in 2 Samuel 16 is not saying Ahithophel was inspired, but it's saying Ahithophel was so accurate when he gave a suggestion or when he offered counsel, that it was like reading the Bible. Anyone here ever found the Bible to be untrue? You haven't, have you? Why? Because it's God's Word. And that's the expression. It was like God spoke when Ahithophel gave counsel. That's a problem, isn't it? Now here's the question. Is Ahithophel's counsel going to suddenly be no more good? Okay, so now look at chapter 17. Here's Ahithophel's counsel. Verse 1. Um, Moreover, Ahithophel said unto Absalom, Let me now choose out 12,000 men, and I will arise and pursue after David this night, and I will come upon him while he is weary and weak-handed, and will make him afraid, and all the people that are with me shall flee. And I will smite the king only, and I will bring back all the people unto thee. The man whom thou seekest is as if... All return, so all the people shall be in peace. And the same pleased Absalom well and all the elders of Israel. Now stop. Ahithophel said this. Give me 12,000 men. I will chase David down. And by myself, I'll kill him. David's best friend. I'll kill him. And none of the people that are with him will do anything about it. And I'll bring them back to you in peace. And sort of, in a sense, they'll kind of blame me. And they'll follow you and, and everything will smooth, be smooth and everything will work out. And everybody thought about what he said. And they thought, yeah, that's true. That would work. In other words, Ahithophel has always, when he's given counsel, it's always been as though it were the oracle of God. And in this instance, it's actually true as well. His counsel is solid. Now you say, that's terrible counsel. What a terrible... No, it's a terrible thing that he wants to do. But it would work. It would accomplish what Absalom is trying to accomplish. And more importantly, listen to me now, hear this. It would accomplish what Ahithophel wants to accomplish more than anything else because Ahithophel wants David dead. Why? He wants his best friend or close friend dead. And the question is why? There's two questions. Why does Ahithophel want David dead? And the second question is, why does Absalom know Ahithophel wants David dead? See, I wouldn't think, would you, of trying to get the king's closest confidant to join my side? I mean, if I'm going to try to start a conspiracy, I'm not going to pick the guy that is most loyal to the king. And that's precisely, if you were to describe Ahithophel, who he was. I mean, for years he'd advised King David, and it was legendary. It was known that when he gives counsel to David, I mean, it's like God said it. Why would he betray David? Why? 
How would Absalom know? You can't tell Mrs. Dollins. You're just dying. It's just killing you, isn't it? Don't tell. Don't ruin it for everybody. She's the spoiler that wants to read the last page of the book. She wants to fast forward to the end of the movie and watch the ending so that she knows whether to be upset when things aren't going well in the middle of it. But hold on to it. We're going to get there. We're almost there. Okay? Um, and then chapter 17 uh, and verse 15. Now remember, David sent Hushai back Verse 6, actually, of chapter 17. Uh, Absalom sent for Hushai. When Hushai was come to Absalom, Absalom spake unto him, saying, Ahithophel has spoken after this manner. Shall we do after his saying? If not, speak thou. And Hushai said unto Absalom, The counsel that Ahithophel hath given is not good at this time. Now, who in the world would have the courage to say that Ahithophel's counsel was no good when Ahithophel's never been wrong? For said Hushai, Thou knowest thy father and his men, that they be mighty men, and they be chafed in their minds, as a bear robbed of her whelps in the field. And thy father is a man of war, and will not lodge with the people. Behold, he is hid now in some pit, or in some other place, and he'll come to pass, when some of them be overthrown at the first, that whosoever heareth it will say, There is a slaughter among the people that follow Absalom. And he also is valiant, whose heart is as the heart of a lion, shall utterly melt. For all Israel knoweth that thy father is a mighty man, and they which be with him are valiant men. Therefore I counsel that all Israel be generally gathered unto thee from Dan even to Beersheba, as the sand is by the sea for multitude, and that thou go to battle in thine own person. Absalom, why don't you go fight your valiant father? <laughs> Think of this. This is an advice. As I said, no good, no good. Sorry, this is popping. Let me move it down just a little. He said, yeah, that's, that's no good. Won't work. Here's why. Everybody knows, everybody knows, Absalom, that your dad is a valiant, courageous man. And if he's hiding in a hole somewhere and his mighty men start fighting for him and you send guys to kill him, what's going to happen to your first guys that go after David? <coughs> They're guaranteed to die. And if they die, then the heart of everybody following them is going to melt. They're going to be scared to death. And, you know, and once they get scared to death, boy, you might as well just go ahead and, and uh, order your tombstone because nobody's going to fight for you and David's going to just come out like a lion and he's going to kill you. And the actual fact of the matter is that wasn't true because David didn't want to kill Absalom. So, here's what you do, Absalom. You go and try to kill your dad. Instead of staying here where you're safe and you have guards, go out in the fields and go hunt for your dad. <laughs> Brilliant. And actually, David's counselors advised him the opposite. They said, you stay here. Job said, you stay here in the city. Don't you go out to battle. We don't want to risk you. And we'll go out and we'll fight. You stay here in a safe place. So here Absalom is in a safe place and he goes out in the field where they think David is. And David stays home and his men go out in the field. The exact opposite of what should happen. I mean, the fa fact is it's a great thing to have valiant leadership, courageous leadership. But David doesn't need to prove any to anyone that he's a valiant man. He's got nothing to prove at this stage in his life. In other words, if they would say, well, David, you know, you want us to go out and risk our lives, but you're not willing to risk our own. He had to be held back from risking his lives a lot of times, except for one time that's actually connected with this story. Now you see where we're going, don't you? What was the one time when David, when David did not go out to war, when kings go out to war? Do you remember that time? You remember when, yeah, he stayed home <coughs> and Bathsheba... He saw Bathsheba and he called her and he committed adultery with her. And because she became with child, he tried to get Uriah to come home so that he'd think it was his child and it didn't work. And so he ended up having Uriah murdered. murdered. Okay. This is where it's coming from. Because the one time David wasn't courageous enough to go out to war is the time that Ahithophel, his closest confidant, his closest counselor, was turned against him. We're going to see why, and then we're going to see why it's a good example of a bad example. It's a pretty tough, pretty tough, tough uh, one to take here. Um, if you'll go to, uh, well, let's see, where am I at? I lost my place. I want to be in Second Chronicles, I believe. Um, no, Second Samuel 23, I think it is. <coughs> Uh, 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 uh. I've got my references all written down wrong here. 1723 maybe? Uh, 
Well, that's Ahithophel's. Okay, this is the end of Ahithophel. We'll read that. That, that is important, but that's actually not where I want to get at because I want to look at the connection. And I've lost my place. I may have to run to the back room and get my other notes. Hope I don't have to take desperate measures. I don't have to. Verse 23. When Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his ass and arose and got him home to his house and to his city and put his household in order and hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. Well, that's extreme, isn't it? You ever read a statement and you think the big crybaby? I mean, nothing's even happened at this point. What happened was that uh, Ahithophel's counsel wasn't followed. Hoshai's counsel was followed. And Ahithophel goes home. He goes home and he puts his house in order and gets everything so that his children, his descendants, won't have to clean up for him. Kind of what my wife does every time you know, we go across town. She says, we don't want somebody to have to clean up after us if we die while we're gone. So we've got to make sure the trash is taken out, all the beds are made, everything's put away. And she says, you know, if we die, we don't want somebody to have to clean up our mess. You know, let's just sort of hit the fell, except he actually knows he's going to die. And so he went home, and the Bible says he hanged himself and died and was buried in the sepulcher of his father. So literally, the question is, did Ahithophel kill himself because his advice was rejected by Absalom? And the answer is actually no. It's what it looks like. It looks like Ahithophel killed himself because Absalom rejected uh, his advice. I need to go to the passage where the Bible lists out David's mighty men. Um, and that should be... Oh, is that where it is? Yeah. yeah. And Ahithophel's in verse 34. Okay. Yes, there we go. Thank you, brother. And actually, that's not what I have written here. I don't know why I didn't write it. I have notes and I messed them up. Nope, there it is, 2334. Okay, in the right place on the wrong side. Okay. Now, if you were to look at verse 23 of 2 Samuel 23, you see a description of Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada. And uh, the Bible says he had his name among the three mighty men. Which one uh, verse? 20, well, verse 22 and 23. The Bible says he was more honorable than the 30, but he attained not to the first three, and David set him over the guard. So there's a description of David's three mighty men. And in chapter 23 of 2 Samuel, there's a description of the things that they did. And these guys were basically superhuman, not, not literally, but the things that they accomplished, the feats they accomplished, these guys were afraid of nothing. The three mighty men were the ones that went back to the well in Bethlehem, remember, to get David a drink. And, I mean, they, they, just, they were afraid of nothing, and everyone was afraid of them. Uh, the guy that's not afraid of anybody is the guy everybody's usually afraid of. Isn't it true? And these guys were not only that, but I mean they had done things that were so mighty and so courageous that, you know, in spite of the fact that David's like the most mighty man in the world, these guys are his three mighty men. They do most of his bidding. They, they do most of the fighting for him. And then the Bible says there was a guy who was not quite up to the par of those three, but he was, you know, right there below them. And David had made him the captain over 30 other men. And the scripture begins in chapter 23 and verse 24 to, to list each of those. You know, Asahel, remember the guy who's a swift of foot. Uh, and uh, he was a brother of, of Joab and a whole bunch of guys. But go up to verse 34. And I want to read two verses. Verse 34, Eliphalet, the son of Ahasavai, the son of Maach, or I'm sorry, Maachathite, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite. And uh, you notice that, oh wait, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite. And then go to verse 39. Uriah, the Hittite, and of these men uh, that, that uh, Benaiah was a guard over, two of those men were uh, Ahithophel and Uriah. Now you can study other passages of Scripture, and you can kind of nail down at this time, the age of David would have been about 40 years old, and these guys would have been younger than David by a little bit. And Uriah would have been quite a bit younger than Eliab. He actually wouldn't have been old enough to be a mighty man, but he ended up being one of David's mighty men. Now Uriah, we know, was the husband of whom? Bathsheba. Bathsheba. And uh, Bathsheba was the granddaughter, uh, or the daughter of Eliam, and the granddaughter of Ahithophel. 
Bathsheba would have grown up in the palace. She would have been significantly younger than King David. And uh, she'd have had access, of course. Uriah would have been a very, very trusted individual in David's court. Eliam, the same. And Ahithophel, these men all would have been not only David's counselors, but they would have been very near to the king. And while Uriah was out serving King David, while Ahithophel, I'm certain, was probably nearby, David committed adultery with Bathsheba, Ahithophel's granddaughter, and murdered his granddaughter's husband. And my friend, that is wrong on every count. Isn't it? That's evil on every account. And when I look at this good example, a bad example, of a man whose counsel was not followed and he was so upset about it that he went and killed himself, I see a man who is consumed by bitterness. I see a man who is justifiably incensed at King David, so much so that he wants to be the one to kill David himself because he's Bathsheba's grandfather. And in spite of his relationship with David, David did that to his family. I'd want to kill him. Just being honest with you, I'd, I'd, I'd want to kill him. I'm telling you, I don't have children, but my virtual children, if you touch one of them. <laughs> I had a real sister. Now I just want to tell you something. Anybody that knew me and my brother knew, you didn't do anything. <coughs> To my sister. You just did you didn't say anything about her and you didn't do anything to her. We'd mess you up. I mean, it was just it didn't happen. There were guys that wouldn't date my sister because they knew that. And we thought, well, if they're scared to date her, well and good. Because they're not the kind of guys we want dating our sister. They might do something if they could. So that was you know, I'm just telling you, I can relate to Hithophel, can't you? He's very relatable as a good example of a bad example. We have to analyze this carefully and closely to really get the heart of God in the whole thing. And actually, when we get the heart of God in the whole thing, as much as when the prophet David came, I'm sorry, the prophet Dathan came to David and said, Thou art the man, when David said, The man that did that should die, and Nathan said, You're the guy that should die, David repented. And a person who was wronged and the testimony of his name who was destroyed more than Ahithophel's forgave David. Was the affront against the God who had promised David that his seed would sit on the throne forever, was he offended more by David's murder of Uriah and adultery with Bathsheba, or was Ahithophel offended more? In actuality, the affront to God was greater, my friend, on every count. Matter of fact, in every instance, hear me now, in every instance, sin is more against God than it is against a person. In every instance. And sometimes we get out of whack and we forget that all through the Scripture, God says, Vengeance belongeth unto me. <coughs> And Ahithophel said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will execute David myself. God, you may forgive him, but I don't. And I don't know how many times in my lifetime I've heard individuals say the very same thing. God may forgive him, but I don't. And you know whose bitterness consumed and killed them? David went to his grave because of old age. And God actually used that adulterous relationship and worked it for good to give Israel King Solomon. But Ahithophel went to his grave bitter and angry and a wreck. Because God may have forgiven, but Ahithophel would not. Now listen for a moment, will you please? There's not a person in this room who has not or will not have 
an instance that if you really think about it and you let it get to you, it's so wrong and it's so unjust that you could say, I'll never forgive them. I'll never forgive them. God may forgive them, but I don't. I won't. And two things will happen as a result of that. First of all, your bitterness will kill you. Your bitterness will kill you. The old saying that they, it's in every wise, uh, in every, a proverb in every, uh, I think in every culture is that the person who is able to make you angry is the one who can control you. It's really true. It's really true. I'll tell you something, that person who has bitterness in them has the poison inside of them that is killing themselves. My friend, bitterness is a poison. And it'll kill you. It'll kill you. It won't hurt the person you're bitter against, but it will kill you for certain. The second reason it's a good example of a bad example is because if God can forgive someone, so can I. You say, Pastor, that's unforgivable. I'm not saying things would ever be the same. I'm not saying, you know, he just needed to forgive, no big deal. I'm saying if God can forgive him, so can I. And that's a fact. Because the problem with any individual who has unforgiveness in their heart is that they've overlooked their own sin. See, you think that the fact that Jesus had to die on the cross because of your sin is no big deal. But whatever that person did to you is. You make very little of the cross and you make, make very much of the wrong that's done against you. Last thing I want to say about it is this. And I want to tell you, you can dispute that, but that's the truth. If God can forgive them, so can I. You can dispute it, but it's the truth. If you'll take your unforgiveness to the cross of Jesus Christ and allow the light of the cross to be the perspective that is shed on your unforgiveness, <coughs> you'll be able to forgive. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's a simple matter, but I'm telling you it's possible, and God wants it, and you can do it. If you won't forgive, my friend, it'll destroy you, and it'll destroy those around you. You'll not only be taken down, but a lot of folks will go down with you. That's a fact. And Ahithophel is a really good example of a bad example. I have to tell you, if I wanted to pick sides, if I wanted to pick the guy who was most justified, if I had to choose between David and Ahithophel, I don't want to side with David. What David did was so wrong on every level. And what Ahithophel did is so relatable on every level. Listen to this. No person had to choose between David and Ahithophel. Actually. Nobody had to choose between David and Ahithophel, even Ahithophel himself. Ahithophel could have just gone with God. I'll tell you, in your life, friend, if it has not happened to this point, it will happen that there's going to be some things that you have to say, God, I'm just going to have to give this one to you. I'm just going to have to take this to the cross. No one has sinned against me the way that I've sinned against you, and that's going to have to just be good enough for me. See, sometimes we make very light of our own sin. We don't even see our need for the Savior because of it. We see other people as terrible, as awful, and as wicked. But the fact of the matter is, when I'm actually honest and real about it, and I go to the cross of Jesus Christ, and I say, you know what? But for the grace of God, I would be God's eternal enemy. Because of the grace of God, I'm His child. And then, in perspective and in light of that, I compare myself with King David, who was an adulterer, and I don't respect that, who was a terrible, pathetic father, and I don't respect that, who was as bad a husband as he was a father, I don't respect that. Who had a heart for God. So much so that no one else had a heart like that. Who God used, and because of His faithfulness to God, God said that there would not fail to sit on His throne a king forever. 
I have to say, okay, I guess he's a better man than I am. Because I'm coming from the perspective of the cross. See, with regard to his sin, Jesus died for them. And God didn't just say, well, David, I'm going to give you a clean slate, nothing required. No, God required something of David. You know what it was? He required his son to die for David. Jesus died for him. If anyone ought to be bitter about that, who ought to be bitter about it? Who isn't bitter about it? God is. He is our example of forgiveness. God our Father is our example of forgiveness. And no one's been wronged the way God has. By David or by me. And when I look at my brethren in perspective of the cross, my comparison isn't what Jesus died for. My comparison really is not with them at all. I just say, God, who am I? And a person who says, who am I, isn't going to be concerned about who someone else is. You say, Pastor, that's a hard pill to swallow. I will not dispute that in the least. And I'll tell you, even a person who's forgiven, if they'll allow themselves to get in the flesh and look back and rethink over things, you can get better again after you've even forgiven. Bitterness is a poison. It's always there and it's always ready to spring up and it's always ready as a tool of the Satan to destroy you. And so Ahithophel is a good example of probably just being what we typically would be in our flesh. Unforgiving. And what Ahithophel needed to do was to take his bitterness to the cross of Jesus Christ. To find cleansing and forgiveness for his own sin and then to realize that Jesus paid for David's sin. When you realize that and you understand the truth of it, my friend, that leaves nothing to say. You just have to let God do a work in your heart. And the last thing I want to say is this. God will do a work in your heart if you'll make a choice of forgiveness. If you say, God, I don't understand how. God, I don't feel it in me. I'm, I just, I want to, I want to kill him. But you say, God, Jesus died for me and I should have been killed. God, will you help me with my unforgiveness? God, will you help me to see my sin in light of the cross and see their sin in light of the cross and see there's actually no difference? Help me to have the compassion and the mercy that you have. My friend, throughout the time, throughout the ages, some of the greatest stories of forgiveness are by the very people who are wronged. I remember when I was a child, I used to read over and over and over again the story of Jim Elliott and his friends through Gates of Splendor. Men that were actually murdered by the very people they had gone to share the gospel to, whose wives and children later on were able to lead those very individuals to the Lord Jesus Christ. When I read the New Testament, I read about uh, Stephen and his death, and I see Saul consenting unto his death. I think that scoundrel, that dirty person, that evil guy. And then I see God save him, and by God's grace, taking a man who called himself the chief of sinners and using his life. I have to say there's something in this forgiveness thing. And so for us this evening, when it comes to unforgiveness, and when it comes to harboring bitterness, Ahithophel is a good example of a bad example. Father, thank you for what we've learned this evening. I pray that you'd impress us with the truth of it. And Lord, if there's unforgiveness in any person here tonight, my prayer, God, would be that they would just realize that bitterness does not kill the person you're bitter against. Bitterness kills the one who's bitter and Lord, it's in Ahithophel's case, he was so angry, he didn't even care about that. He went and took his own life. What a tragedy, what a waste, when he could have been a picture of grace. Help us to be pictures of grace, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your good attention. You're dismissed. <coughs> <coughs> <There's> <coughs>